Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council. This time on Broad and High, a black lick potter welcomes us into his studio. We chat with CCAD's Denny Griffith, and we check in on the bison herd grazing on the Derby Plains. First off, they're not buffalo. They are the American bison. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi, I'm Audrey Hassan, your host for Broad and High, the ultimate intersection of arts and culture, where we explore the character and creativity not only in Columbus, but across the country. Jason Wolf started working with Clay when he was only eight. He now works and teaches out of his home in Blacklick and focuses on making one-of-a-kind and functional pieces of pottery. His cookware is not only food safe, but also oven, microwave, and dishwasher safe. From bread bakers and berry bowls to garlic jars and coffee mugs, we go inside Jason's studio for a first-hand look in how he makes and markets his creations. I started making uh, pottery about 25 years ago. Well, my parents uh, originally signed me up for uh, art classes, and then I took a ceramics class, and I uh, kind of fell in love and been making pots ever since. I actually really like making functional pottery. I, maybe it's the craftsman in me. I like to create something and then able to use it. We are in my uh, home studio in my basement and we're teaching classes here now and this is where I do the bulk of my production. What I do with my pottery is I'll do uh, wheel thrown um, altered forms. I come in and I just use that rib. give the pot a little bit more movement than that uh, than the straight wall had. And there you go, the cup is finished. It's a two-step process. So the first firing is called the bisque firing. After that, we're gonna do the glaze firing. Our glazes we make ourselves, and we make in-house from recipes that we've been working on for, for years. The bisque ware is what I'm glazing right now. This stuff is like a sponge. So it's actually absorbing the water that's in the glaze, and what's left is that chemical coating. Now I'm going to let these sit for about five minutes and then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to glaze the outside surface. We offer um, two different classes. We offer ones for beginners on Tuesday nights and we offer an advanced class on Thursday nights. Okay, what we got? So, um, a little bit of this stuff goes a long way, so you don't have to put that much into it. The class tonight is actually the advanced class. They, they're coming in and they're going to be doing a lot of glazing, but we're also going to talk about all their tests. So if you guys want to brighten up your colors, put white slip on your pieces. All the pottery that we produce um, is oven safe, food safe, dishwasher safe. Uh, you put it in the microwave as well, and it's all lead free glazes. We make bread bakers, uh, brie bakers, we make mugs in two different sizes, we have garlic jars, we have honey pots, we have vases, and the list goes on. I mean, we make actually about 30 different products, and a lot of the baking dishes that we make uh, here at the studio, we do provide recipes with them. 
Uh, we're thinking about things that we have a need for, stuff that we like to use in our own kitchen. You know, there's lots of things that I could make, but it doesn't mean I really want to create. One of our community's most treasured arts leaders will be retiring next summer from his post as president of the Columbus College of Art and Design. Denny Griffith has long advocated that the livability of Columbus is tied to the vibrancy of our art scene, and he was recently honored by the Greater Columbus Arts Council as the epitome of the artist citizen. WOSU's Tom Ryland gives us a profile of Denny Griffith, the administrator and the artist. It's been a hell of a good ride. It's the most satisfying, exhilarating, humbling thing I ever could have imagined doing. In his 16 years as president of the Columbus College of Art and Design, Denny Griffith has transformed the downtown campus, doubling its size and expanding its curriculum during a time of massive change in the art and design world. The recent launch of the Mind Market has set the college's sights on the future. And connecting with the community, the business community, the nonprofit sector through projects like our Mind Market, which is our uh, small business incubator and our design lab, which is really the, kind of the bridge between the college and the outside world, the real world, where we bring projects in, um, pr predominantly design related projects that we can put cross disciplinary teams of. of um, students from various majors, faculty, and real-world clients coming in who need, uh, who need innovation and creativity, and of course we deliver that in spades. So that mind market has then really kind of created the forecast for the new college, which we effectively launch next fall, which is um, a really deep uh, commitment to adding business education into the art and design education. So where are we headed, Denny? Uh, we are headed Griffith has always sought balance between his work as a college and community leader and his creative side. His refuge is a small garage behind his home. This was really kind of the perfect setup because um, I've got my man cave out here. I can, <laughs> I can make a giant mess and I never get in any trouble. You can scream it. and yell. Yeah, that's thing. right. Turn up the music, which is good. Great. Here you go, Tom. Come on in. Thanks, Denny. I've got to get the lights here. All right. So, wow. this is my studio, and uh, a special spot here. I spend a lot of time out here. So, as you can see here, I'm um, trying to work in series. I do a lot of different pieces, all kind of in a in a similar kind of style, a similar way of working. And um, in the case of this work, what I'm doing is using a uh, a tool like, I mean, this is really high tech stuff. This is a this is an old window scraper, and while the wax is still warm, I'm going back and cutting into the surface and pulling down through multiple layers Can of. Touch of, this? Yeah, Better. yeah. Help yourself. It is very thick, isn't it? Yeah, it's. it's it, I, see, I have this love affair with um, with texture, and of course, as you can see, with color. What I've been trying to do is boil this, these paintings down to a kind of to the essence of surface texture and and lines that have a kind of familiar quality, but then you really aren't really sure what you're looking at. And so what's, I think, exciting for me is when people come to this work and they say, well, I see this in it, or I see that in it. I see the Mississippi River that I grew up yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> these things really do read as a kind of, as kind of maps in a way, as a, as a kind of a sense of, you know, curving rivers or, uh, perhaps in the case of some of the ones over here, uh, like this, this, this large yellow one, um, uh, more like grasses growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, it just mm -hmm. depends on, well, it depends on a lot of things. Most of all, it depends on what the viewer brings with them to the work. This is about improvisation. This is about um, reaching inside and trying to find a way of making things that's very individualistic. It's the thing that balances me, though, in that external world. And that external world, this, the college world, also informs what I do here because I'm every day I'm dog paddling in the art and design universe. I've given 
given my all to the college for 16 years, and it has been a love affair with the place. Um, but because it's kind of a 24-7 sort of job, um, no matter where you are, you are the president of the college, and so you represent the college. And, um, and uh, your day doesn't stop at 5 o'clock. It goes well into the evenings and many, many weekends. And so I could feel myself beginning to long for more respite, more quiet time, more individual time. And, um, and when I started to feel I thought I have a responsibility then not to hold on to a job just because I love it, but to share that wonderful job with somebody else who can also love it. What, what are the traits do you think that have uh, made you, well, both a successful administrator hmm. and, and artist? Yeah. Oh, you mean other than like drooling? Oh. <laughs> do that well. <laughs> Uh, a sense of humor, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it? it's yeah, it's really there are, um, you know, there aren't that many art jokes. I think we all take ourselves pretty <laughs> seriously. Uh, so um, yeah, it's important to be able to laugh and have fun. It's imp I think important to have um, empathy for other people. But you know, a, a, a life uh, in and around the arts and culture. First of all, I mean, I mean, let's all right. So let's let's talk about what what makes that special. The mm -hmm. arts in, are really the exemplification of the pursuit of human excellence, in much the same way I think as athletics are, uh, just in a different form. And so you know, we see human beings at their best through literature and through dance and through music and certainly through the visual arts and design arts. Um, and then. The arts have been a pathway to um, encountering, in a not in a negative, aggressive way, but in a comfortable way, ideas and people and cultures that are different from the ones that I was raised with. Mm -hmm. When I was brought to the arts, it opened it opened me up, uh, and it's made me, I think, more tolerant and more inquisitive, uh, more curious about things that are different as opposed to you know pushing back from them. And I think there are an awful lot of people in our world who instantly just push back from the unfamiliar. So the embrace of the unfamiliar is, I think, one of the things that this life has done for me and to me. And, uh, and so therefore, I like to, I like to try to um, inflict that in, the, in, a, in, a, in a happy way, an appropriate way, on other people to help them open up their horizons. So Denny, we're going to do a word association mm -hmm. game. Uh, just a word or two about every word I mentioned to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so inspiring. Um, uh, the arts. Sad. Um, Closed-mindedness. Love. Um, joy. Politics. Uh, dysfunctional. The future. Oh, damned exciting. Yeah, really, uh, the future. Not scary at all. Um, just I hope we get tomorrow. You know, everybody thinks tomorrow is a promise, and then stuff happens, and you know we're not here. So let's let's like be here now, and uh, and grin about tomorrow. One of the exciting things about Broad and High is we get to introduce you to some of the great artists around the country. And in return, PBS stations all across the U.S. will share our own Central Ohio segments to their communities, giving national exposure to our local talent. So now we'd like to share with you this story from our friends at Oregon Public Broadcasting. The Last Supper is a provocative exhibit by artist Julie Green. She gives us a tour of the more than 500 plates that encompass her installation, each with its own dark story to tell. Every plate documents the last meal of a death row inmate. to make something that brought the viewer in, that had a degree of beauty, so that they would look at the plates and then go, oh, that's what they're about. Each of these plates represents the final meal of a prisoner on death row. Julie Green was teaching art in Oklahoma when the idea came to her while reading the paper over breakfast. In Oklahoma at that time, there were many executions, highest per capita in the United States, still is, and so I just started saving these clippings. They bothered me. 
Oklahoma, 8 July, 1999, six tacos, six glazed donuts, and a cherry Coke. Texas, 22 October, 2001, a bag of Jolly Ranchers. The project, as you can tell, has many different shapes of plates. They're all basically white or off-white. Most are porcelain, some are stoneware. Um, different sizes, they're almost all secondhand. When Martha Stewart was in prison, I did go to Kmart and buy uh, a Martha Stewart plate um, that I happened to notice. I wanted them all to be basically white, look uniform, look like a system, but not a matte set because they represent individuals. This is a Florida plate and for lobster, shrimp, baked potato, cheesecake, uh, and a drink. And the information came back. Um, he enjoyed his last meal, ate every bite. This is a North Carolina plate one honey bun. When you walk into the gallery, it's this beautiful display of plates. It's almost homey. And uh, then the content is just a, a big flip. This is an Indiana plate and the words mother on the front from 2001. German ravioli and chicken dumplings prepared by his mother and prison dietary staff. So his mother actually received clearance to come into the prison kitchen and cook that meal. Julie's work draws from an approach to art in Mexico called retablo. Retablo in Mexican painting is like remi remembrance of something that will otherwise go unnoticed. These are um, Mississippi menus, 23 July, 1947, same, fried chicken, watermelon. He was only 16, he was only 15. There were two boys quickly convicted of murder. And executed by a traveling electric chair the next day. A traveling electric chair. I ordered those special from the China painting catalog because they were appropriate for those two meals. Because they were so young? Yeah, because they were so young. They're very small plates. They're, they're palm of the hand size. This is an Indiana plate and the information from the Department of Corrections came back. He never had a birthday cake, so we ordered a birthday cake for him. It's very important. It is important uh, in a sense that it fulfills one of art's roles. There are many, but it makes us stand still and think. Think about something we don't really want to think about. Texas represents a third of all the plates, about a third of all the plates in the show, and these five Texas plates um, consecutive in fall of 2007 had no final meal request, had no final meal request, had no final meal request. This tells me that the inmates are aware of what other inmates are eating or not eating. The variety of the plates also reflect the different ways the states implement the death penalty. Oklahoma dropped its final meal allowance from $20 to $15. This plate represents the last final meal request granted in Texas. When the prisoner returned his meal untouched, the state stopped the practice. In many states are limited to what's on hand in the prison pantry. So you can really tell, like in Oklahoma, you get restaurant meals, same with California. And so those are more varied. This is an Oregon plate. Um, the request is five eggs sunny side up. Um, it's a breakfast meal, pancakes. And the request closed with, I would appreciate the eggs hot. One plate centers around pecan pie. An Arkansas inmate with brain damage ate half before his execution, thinking he could eat the other half after the execution was over. He didn't understand. He didn't understand. Yeah. There is misery in this whole process from the crime that was committed. Somebody was generally murdered, so there was victims, victims' family, so many levels of suffering. Part of my motivation for the project is that it generates conversation on our system of capital punishment. And, and it has done that to a far greater degree than I would have ever expected. The Last Supper depicts the most humane moment in a long chain of misery that starts and ends with death. By focusing on the mundane, limited choices of food, by putting them on grandma's china, 
and by staying true to the individual details of each meal, Julie Green hopes her art will cause more and more people to notice. It's one of the many reasons why she's still painting plates. I paint 50 a year, that's my plan to keep doing that um, until we don't have capital punishment anymore. Everybody has an opinion about capital punishment, actually, it seems like. And even my mom, it's changed my mom, so I figure, you know, right, I can't, I can't go about like trying to change people on capital punishment, but if it happens, um, that's fabulous. When European settlers first arrived in Ohio, there were many bison roaming the state. But the last bison was killed in Ohio in Lawrence County in the early 1800s. After many years of prairie restoration at Battelle Darby Creek Metro Park on the far west side, introducing bison was a logical next step. They'd help thin the vegetation, add richness and diversity to the ecosystem, and help draw visitors to the prairie. In 2011, six bison, all female, were brought to their new home. This summer, a male bison joined the group. We decided to visit the park to get an update on the herd, its contributions to the prairie landscape, and finally learn the difference between a buffalo and a bison. We're in Battelle Darby Creek Metro Park, which is about 10 miles west of downtown Columbus off of State Route 4. This is the largest metro park in the state of Ohio. It's over 7,000 acres in size. We're in the northern part of the, of the park in one of our prey restoration areas here at Darby. The uh, restoration projects were conversions of farmland, and to date we've converted over 1,500 acres of farmland into Darby Plains Prairie using seed genetically native to the Darby Plains. It's the largest project, restoration project of this type in Ohio. The idea was, was to create a large, undisturbed block of prey restoration that would hopefully give us some visual idea of what the original Darby Plains prairies looked like that occurred west of Columbus. Well, bison were a part of the original prairie ecosystem, not only across the Midwest, but even into Ohio. A fair number of prairies extended east into Ohio. The area here west of Columbus, the Darby Plains, was the largest prairie area prior to settlement at about 380 square miles. And then the bison, they were grazers, main grazers in the prairie. They kept it grazed down for a number of other animals. If you have nothing out there eating the grass, it gets too thick and too thick for some of the birds and not some of the mammals that uh, would otherwise live, live there. First off, they're not buffalo. They are the American bison. Well, a buffalo is actually a different uh, genus. But in America, bison and buffalo are the same thing. Well, we have seven bison here that are just a, a great, so six of them are female. Uh, we brought in a male uh, late this summer, so we should have some baby bison in the spring. They, they range in age from four to 10 years old. They get quite large. The American bison is the largest North American land mammal that we have. Uh, a bull bison, the males, will reach up to 2,000 pounds. Uh, bison are active about 18 hours a day. Uh, they feed heavily. Uh, they'll feed well, maybe an hour, hour and a half or so, and then they'll stop and they'll chew their cud, just like a cow does. They are a member of the bovine family, so they're very closely related to cows. Normally, the Females and the young stay in herds. Uh, there is a matriarchal setup to the herd. There's one usually very large cow who's in charge, and where she goes, the rest of the herd goes. Now the males, the bulls, they only come to the cows during the rut, the mating season. The rest of the time, the males either stay in small male herds or they're out by themselves. Uh, which one's the bull? is the, one of the, the best questions right now because uh, he's not a large animal. You can't spot him right away. Uh, he's three years old. He hasn't reached that full 1,800, 2,000 pound mature level yet. And he seems to, to hang out with the girls. But uh, once you look at them for a little while, you can tell. Uh, his horns seem to go more straight up than the cows who have a tendency to curve in. Uh, 
he's a broader animal also. The, the bulls especially have a big beard in front of them. Uh, the, the cows do also, it doesn't seem to be as large. But during times of blizzards, they just turn and face the wind, close their eyes and put their head down. And that big beard and all that heavy wool fur on the front of them protects them. In the summer, uh, we have them in the prairie pastures. During the winter, we bring them down into the lower pastures to give them a break from the cold winter wind. We have two paddocks. We have a winter paddock, which they're in right now, which has cool season grasses in it, which stay green that they can uh, graze and digest over the course of the winter. And then in the summer, we move them up into one of our restored prairie areas of about 40 acres. And it has Indian grass, big blue stem, and some of the native prairie species which they cannot digest once they die off and turn brown in the winter. We get lots of crowds still for this and we're expecting even bigger crowds in spring when we get some babies out here. Uh, but people love them. They love seeing these big animals roaming the prairies of Ohio again. That's our show. To see more of today's stories and for extra bonus features from this episode, visit WOSU.org. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We'll see you at the ultimate intersection of arts and culture next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing and connecting the community to cultural events, artists, and classes at columbusarts.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council.